All right. <clears throat> So let's continue with where we were yesterday. All right. So yesterday we started talking about power series manipulation. Okay. And essentially just like stuff we've kind of been doing, but expanding on a little bit, you know, working more with taking derivatives, integrating, even eventually today, we're going to be finding extrema of these things. Okay. So local mins, local maxes, that kind of deal. All right. And just kind of working a little bit more with these power series and stuff. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we'll start here with example eight, all right, and we're given g of x there is equal to e to the x minus e to the negative x all over two, and we're going to find, for letter A, the power series expansion of g of x, okay, so we want to come up with a power series for g of x uh, by showing the first four non-zero terms and then also the general term, okay, so if we, um, if we want to go about doing this, right, we want to build g of x here, well, what power series functions we maybe start with? e to the x, exactly right, okay, because, I mean, that's, you know, a major component here of this power series. Bless you. So, we remember e to the x, right, it's 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x to the 2 over 2 factorial plus x to the 3 over 3 factorial. All right. So, there's, like, the first four terms there. All right, right. Well, while doing e to the x, it'll also be helpful for us to come up with e to the negative x, right? And we'll subtract them. So let's then say what e to the negative x would be. Okay. Well, that's just a composition there. We were, we're changing the x's now all to be negative x's. So whereas e to the x starts with 1, what's e to the negative x going to start with? 1 still, right? There's no x to plug in there, so that still is 1. But then e to the x has positive x over 1 factorial, e to the negative x then will be what? Yeah, just going to be negative x, right? We're just going to replace all these x's with negative x's here. So this is going to become minus x over 1 factorial plus, now, negative x squared will still be positive, so we can leave that x squared over 2 factorial, right? And then x to the third, that will become now a negative x to the third over 3 factorial. Okay, so there's the first four terms there, but then we want to take these two things and what are we, what are we supposed to do with e to the x and e to the negative x? Subtract them. So we're going to subtract the quantities here, so minus, I'm going to put a big old minus in front of there, and we can see that, well, do I have enough terms written up there? I have the first four non-zero of e to the x, I have the first four non-zero of e to the negative x, but when I start combining things together, what's going to happen? Some stuff's going to cancel, right? I mean, sorry, so for example here, um, so when I go to combine these kind of two things together here, okay, one, yeah, bless you, one minus one goes away. And so that's a, now a zero term, but we want the first four non-zero terms. We can do this one, right? X over one factorial minus a negative X over one really means plus positive. And so we're going to have then two times the x over 1 factorial, right? But then the x squared terms are also going to cancel because it's a positive x squared over 2 factorial minus a positive x squared over 2. So those are going to cancel. But then we do get a um, plus 2x to the third over 3 factorial, right? So why don't you guys go ahead and finish it off here then? So expand out further here so that you get, we need two more terms, right? You maybe can see know what other terms you're going to need there. Maybe you can see the pattern already, okay? But, um, or maybe you can always already tell by the pattern what the next two terms are going to be. But go ahead, take a minute or two, and come up with the next two non-zero terms, right? We need, we need four total. So go ahead and do that. <clears throat> Bless you.
should be something like that. Okay. So we'll have, there's our first four non-zero terms. All right, and again, we're subtracting that quantity there. That's why all those minuses become out of the opposites and stuff. We still have one more thing we have to do. What do we still have to do to both sides here? Divide by 2, right? And thank goodness we can get rid of all those 2s there. So, yeah, so we'll write that out. So e to the x minus e to the negative x all over 2. And so all these 2s are just going to cancel. Dividing both sides of an equation by 2, right? Everything is divided by 2 on the left-hand side. Everything is divided by 2 on the right-hand side there. Okay. All right. So, again, we're also supposed to come up with a general term here. Okay. So let's take a look, again, just at the pattern and see what's happening here. We start with 1, and then we go to 3, 5, and 7. So we're going up by 2 each time in our factorial there. Okay. So that would indicate, since we're repeated addition by 2, right, it would be a 2n. But of course, 2n doesn't quite get us what we need there because we need that to be 1. And let's see here. I guess we'll say this is like our n equals 0 term here. We'll start with n equals 0 there. Okay? So if that's n equals 0, then we want, um, when we plug in 0 here, we want to get a 1 factorial. So 2n plugging in 0 will add 1 to that, right? And that'll give us the 2n plus 1 in the factorial there. Okay? And then x is also in our numerator here. And what will its power have to be then? 2n plus 1 as well, right? It perfectly matches our factorial there, which is nice. Don't have to think too much more than that. So there is our general term. And there are our first four non-zero terms there. <clears throat> OK, so question, John. How do we get the multiplying by 2? The 2n two part? No, the base. How do we get the twos, the two, these twos? Yes. Ah. So when we did the subtraction here, right? So first of all, and we had like a 1 minus a 1, they canceled, right? Obviously. But then when you had x over 1 factorial minus a negative, minus a negative becomes plus positive, so there's two of them now because of the exact same thing. Okay? All right, so letter B. Any, sorry, any other questions there? All right, so letter B, the relationship between g of x and the series h of x was 1 plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial plus x to the 6th over 6 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. So this is g of x. Remember, right? This is what we found here, g of x to be. That's the general term for g of x. There's like the first four terms of g of x. And here's h of x right here. So looking at these two functions, right, g of x, first four term. OK, looking at these two functions, there's g of x's first four terms. There's h of x's first four terms. How can we say these two functions are related? So Nick? They're both uh, trig functions about the Okay, both trig functions without the alternating piece. True, true, true. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. There's another relationship here I'm, I'm looking for, though. Yeah? It's like the 2n, but not the plus 1. The 2n, but not the plus 1 part. Aha, right. Yes, okay. So, right. And so what kind of, like, calculus operation results in that? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yes, yes. These are derivatives, okay? In fact, which one is the derivative of which one? H is the derivative of G. Yeah, H is equal to G prime. Okay, H of X is equal to G prime of X, right? Take the derivative here of that first term. The derivative of X is going to be a 1, so it's 1 over 1 factorial, or just 1. The derivative of X cubed will be 3X squared, right? 3X squared, but then 3 and the 3 will cancel there, right? And so you can see it's going to be exactly that H of X there. <coughs> Everyone okay with that? Anyone need to see that worked out or anything like that? We all we buy that. So let me just show you here just in case. So again, here is g of x, which is equal to x over 1 factorial plus x to the 3 over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial plus x to the 7 over 7 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. Right? g prime of x then is going to be 1 over 1 factorial plus 3x squared over 3 factorial plus 5x to the 4th over 5 factorial plus 7x to the 6th over 7 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. Right? And then the 1 and 1 factorial obviously makes 1. 3 over the 3 factorial. Again, 3 and then 3 factorial, they'll simplify to just 2 factorial then. So it's x squared over 2 factorial. 5 and 5 factorial. Again, 5 factorial is 5 times 4 times 3 times 3 times 1. So we take that lead one away. It just becomes 4 factorial. And then same thing here, x to the 6th over 
6 factorial like that, plus dot, dot, dot. And you can see that is exactly what we've got right there. <coughs> okay, same deal, same deal. Okay. So then letter C asks us to come up with the equation represented in the power series expansion for the function h of x. So it wants us to come up with the equation represented in the power series expansion for the function h of x. Okay. So what can we do to find the function h of x? Take the derivative of what? G of x. Take the derivative of g of x. We're trying to find the function that describes the power series. So we're going to exactly right. We're just going to take this and take the derivative of it. All right, so g of x is equal to e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. And we're going to take the derivative of this thing. So how do we take the derivative again? So we could use quotient rule here. So yeah, we can break it up. Let's break it up here first. So we're actually, we're, gonna just, we're just going to break it up. So let's break it up, make it 1 half e to the x minus 1 half e to the negative x, like that. Okay, right? that's, that's not taking the derivative. We just simplify it a little bit. And now, hopefully, we can all take this derivative, right? I know it's been a while since we've been doing some of this stuff. but And the new stuff pushes the old stuff out. But derivative of 1 half e to the x, 1 half e to the x. Derivative of 1 half, or minus 1 half e to the negative x, plus 1 half e to the negative x. So it goes really to, to that, which is then equal to h of x. Okay. <coughs> so since g and h have this relationship, there's no need to work, there's no need to like take the power series h and then rewrite it as the function h, we can just take g's derivative and get h that way, right? Bypassing the need to like, you know, write, write a power series from h, h's power series. Or write, write a function from the power series. We can just, you know, take the derivative there. And that's all there is to it. Okay. Pretty neat. Questions on any of that? All right, so let's proceed on here. So numbers 9 and 10, these are free response questions, all right? And um, take, taken from you know other tests and things like that. All right. And so we're going to run work through two of these here, and then for homework tonight, uh, you guys will have some actual free response questions to work on, too. Okay. So hopefully we'll get through these pretty quickly. You guys have plenty of time to work on it in class here, and you know all that stuff. All right. You'll notice also like there's a, a missing letter B here, but that's because the letter B was not pertinent to. Or I think, I think it's like stuff that we're going to be learning later. So that's why they didn't have us. We're not going to worry about that letter B part right now. So the function f is defined by the power series. Well, there. OK, you can see some steps. And of course, the general term there, which is kind of silly. They write the general term because it's just the, the series. But anyway, um, for all real numbers x, letter a says find f prime of 0 and f prime prime of 0. Determine whether f has a local maximum, a local minimum, uh, or neither at x equals 0. Give a reason for your answer. So, whoa, right? We're bringing back like stuff from September, right in here. Local maxima, local minimum, okay? Or neither at x equals zero. Give a reason for your answer. So, let's first of all focus on finding f prime of zero. So, if we look at our kind of expansion of the power series here, what do we, what can we, what can we say that f prime of zero is going to be? Can anyone just see it? Can't just kind of like do it mentally, I'd say. Yeah. Sean? Is it zero? Yes, it is zero. It is going to be zero. Okay. F prime of zero is zero. Okay. If you if you want to see like a reason, how did you know that, right? Well, imagine this is f of x, right? F of x is defined by this power series. So therefore, f prime of x, okay, right? It will be, well, what's the derivative of one? Zero, so that goes away, right? Completely gone. What's the derivative of minus x squared over 3 factorial? Well, it'll be minus 2x over 3 factorial, right? So you can imagine then, just from, from and then every other term here is going to have an x in it still, right? It'll be 4x cubed, 6x to the fifth. And since we're going to be finding f prime of 0, any term that has an x in it will be what? Zero. zero. So all these other terms are going to have zeros, right? So plus, dot, 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 you know, kind of thing. They're all going to be zero. So f prime of 0 is zero. F prime of zero is just going to be zero there. But what about f prime prime of zero? Will it also be zero? 
No. What will f prime prime of 0 be? One third, right? So imagine we'll take the derivative one more time here for this term, right? So the derivative of zero will still be zero. The derivative one more time of this will be then minus two over three factorial, which is two over six, right? Which is then negative two, negative one third there. Okay, which I missed that negative there. Okay, so it's negative one third. All right. So we've answered those two pieces, but now we're supposed to answer whether f has a local maximum, a local minimum, or neither at x equals zero. So how how are we supposed to figure that out? And why they have us find the first derivative and the second derivative at zero? <coughs> So what is the, the, so the first derivative being 0, okay, the first derivative equaling 0 indicates we have what kind of point of our function? The first derivative equaling 0 means we have a critical point, critical point, critical point, a possible relative maximum, relative minimum, right? The second derivative being negative 1 third at 0, what does that tell us about our function? Concave down. So we know we have a critical point at 0, and it's also concave down at 0. It's a relative or local maximum. Exactly right. That's the second derivative test, right? Second derivative test. We don't use that one as often as the first derivative test, but as a local maximum. And again, for our, give a reason for your answer, because f prime of 0 is 0, and f prime prime of 0 is less than 0. That's all you need to say. You don't need to state second derivative test. It's, that, that's sufficient right there. Okay. T. All right, pretty straightforward. Let's go to letter C. Actually, any questions on A? I shouldn't say that. Questions on A? We're all good. All right, moving on here. Show that y equal to f of x is a solution to the differential equation x times, I think that's just a single prime, yeah, x times y prime plus y equals cosine of x. Okay, so show that y equal to f of x. So when we talk about y prime and y here, we're really talking f prime and f. Okay, show that that is a solution to that differential equation. So, hmm. what might be a good thing for us to find here in order to kind of show that x times y prime plus y equals cosine x. Where should we start with this? So, well, you want to you want to solve for like for y here? We could do that. We could do that. That's one thing. I think it's in a good good enough format for what we need to do. But what else? What kind of what do we need? Do we know what f of x is? Yeah. Yeah. It's this. It's this right here, right? So we know f of x. What don't we know yet, though? We don't know y prime. So let's maybe write out the first couple terms for for that. Okay. So. Um, f prime of x <coughs> all right, is going to equal, well, we have the first term, right? It was 0 and then minus 2x over 3 factorial plus 4x to the third over 5 factorial minus 6x to the 7 over 7, 6x to the 7, 6x to the 5 over 7 factorial. I'm getting ahead of myself there. Plus dot, 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 plus, and I'm also going to take the derivative of the general term here just because maybe it'll be, Helpful to see that here. So 2n x to the 2n minus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. <coughs> okay. So there's f prime. But then what are we supposed to do to f prime according to this equation we're trying to you know, show we have the solution for here? What are we supposed to do with that f prime? Multiply by x. Okay, so x times f prime of x, so we're going to have then, I'm going to not write the 0 here anymore, so we'll have um, negative 2x squared over 3 factorial plus 4x to the 4 over 5 factorial minus 6x to the 6 over 7 factorial plus dot 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 plus, and then we're multiplying that x through here, so it'll be negative 1 to the n, 2n, and then multiplying x to the 2n minus 1, 
times an x is going to give us x to the what power? x to the 2n, right? This is x to the 1, so we multiply x to the 1 times x to the 2n minus 1. You add your exponents, so 1 plus 2n minus 1 becomes just 2n. So x to the 2n over 2n plus 1 factorial. You can also confirm that just by looking at the pattern here, right? The, the, um, <clears throat> we have x to the 2n, so like the powers are all one lower than your, like your factorials or something like that, too. Okay. <clears throat> or you have 2n as your lead coefficient, right, for the x, and it's also to the 2n, so you see the 2 and the 2, the 4 and the 4, the 6 and the 6, stuff like that, too, to help you there. Okay. And then to this, to this, what are we supposed to add to this, then? Just y, or just plus f of x, right? So I'll, um, let's see here. I'm going to put f of x underneath of it and try and like line up my terms here. So f of x is 1 minus x squared over 3 factorial plus x to the 4 over 4, over 5 factorial, whoopsies, um, minus x to the 6 over 7 factorial plus dot, 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 plus We're going to add, oops, I drew a line through the three there, but we're going to add these things together. <clears throat> and so then f of x, oh, x f prime of x plus f of x will equal, so we have the one there. We have a negative 2x squared over 3 factorial but then plus another negative x squared over 3 factorial. So what's that going to really be? Negative 2x squared over 3 factorial plus a negative x squared over 3 factorial. Negative 3x squared over 3 factorial, right? Minus 3x squared over 3 factorial. Okay. And then here for the x to the fourths, we have a 4x to the fourth over 5 factorial plus another x to the fourth over 5 factorial. So that makes 5x to the fourth over 5 factorial. And then negative 6x to the 6 plus another negative, so minus 7x to the 6th over 7 factorial plus dot, 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 plus. Let's go ahead and add these together here, too. <clears throat> Ooh, that's going to be pretty messy, but all right, I'll do it here. Crazy, crazy guy, crazy guy. All right, um, so what I'm going to do for the numerators, I'm going to like, mm, all right, we'll just do this. So I'm just going to add the numerators together because we have a common denominator there of the 2n plus 1 factorial. So you can see I took my numerator here. Right? When you add fractions, you just add the numerators together. So we're going to add or what we have common denominators at least. right? So you take my numerator there and add my numerator over there. Okay. Now we can simplify these terms right here. So this becomes, well, the 3 over 3 factorial, or sorry, the 3x squared over 3 factorial becomes what? x squared over 2 factorial, you got it, yeah. And then 5x to the 4th over 5 factorial four, or it becomes x to the 4th over 4 factorial. And then 7x to the 6th over 7 factorial becomes just x to the 6th over 6 factorial plus dot, dot, dot. And I'll hold off on simplifying that for right now. What is this? This is cosine. Exactly right. So check. We verified that, in fact, xy prime plus y does equal cosine. Okay. So, um, questions on any of that? Okay, so, oh yeah, Kyle? Did we have to do the general term with it? No, you didn't have to. No. So, so I kind of wanted to, I did it because I wanted to kind of show both ways here. You could do it only in the general term. So, for example, when I first was doing this problem, you know, on my own, because yeah, believe it or not, I do do the notes ahead of time. Sometimes I know it might not seem like it, but I do. Um, anyway, so um, when I was trying to do this, I skipped writing out these first few terms. I did it strictly with the general term. So, in other words, what you could do here, since, you know, the, this general term kind of represents the entire power series, I took the derivative of just this, multiplied it by x, which is what we kind of did, you know, right here. 
right? And then I took this and added it with my general term here. So I skipped all this stuff and just did all this work right here. Oh, hello, Mark. <laughs> um, and then believe it or not, when you combine these, so again, I skipped all this stuff and I just did all these general terms here. And when you add these together, they actually do simplify to, um, they do simplify to cosine of x. Okay, the way you would do this here, if you look, if you look here, you can factor out some terms. So for example, both this piece right here and this piece right here, what's the GCF we can factor out from the numerator there? They have, both have a negative one to the n and the x to the 2n, right? So you factor out that negative one to the n and the x to the 2n, what's gonna be left behind in the parentheses? Yeah, from here, there's a 2n left behind. From here, there's nothing, but that means we were gonna put down a a one, right, plus one, and oh my gosh, that's exactly what we've got in the denominator there, two n plus one, right? So the two n plus one here can cancel out with that one here, and so it becomes just negative one to the n, x to the two n over um, two n factorial. Wow. Okay, right, because two n plus one and the two n plus one factorial. Remember, this this two n plus one factorial will be two n plus one, and the next term will be 2n, and then 2n minus 1, 2n minus 2, 2n minus 3, so on and so forth, right? And so this was simplified just to that, which is exactly cosine as well, okay? Now, there's one other thing that you might be able to see here, and this one's a little bit harder to see, okay? So I would say probably most, you know, most straightforward maybe from what we're most comfortable with. This maybe is the most comfortable right here, what we did, okay, just so it's cosine. This maybe is the next, you know, next most comfortable. But then the next thing I wanted to point out too is if we go back to the power series there, did anyone recognize this power series? Or it's awfully close to what power series? Sine. It's awfully close to sine, except sine should have 2n plus 1 up here. So, yeah, Sean? So if you multiply x by the x, you can x. Right. Or another way to think about it is. This is sine of x, but we're, we're going to remove an x from the numerator, so it's sine of x over x. Okay. So alternatively to all of this, if you saw here that this is very close to sine, and all it did is you just had to divide by an x there, you could then just take, this is our function, this is exactly f of x. And so you could like just literally do you know, the derivative of sine of x over x, multiply it by x, and then add sine x over x to it, and you would simplify it to be cosine x that way. With bypassing all the power series stuff if you really wanted to. But of course, that is contingent on you recognizing that that was sine of x over x there. Okay. What's that? You need to know sine of x, and you can see that this was close to it. So, you know, maybe. But do you have to know sine of x over x? No. But I mean, just understand that that is, this is just a manipulation of sine of x is the sine of x over x. Is that helpful or not? I don't know. But I mean, it's interesting, right? We could have completely bypassed all this power series stuff. So. That is the capability. Yep. Yeah. No, no, no problem. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> You're welcome. All right, so let's flip over here to our last example. All right, so the function f has derivatives of all orders at x equals 0, and the Maclaurin series for f is given by that, okay? So rather than, you know, us having to write out all the you know, of the first four terms for the Maclaurin series and then coming up with the series, they gave us the series right here um, written out in, you know, this, this in the summation notation and stuff like that, okay? So this right here, right, this is the infinite sum here would be precisely equal to f of x, okay? And so we want to find f prime of zero and then the fourth derivative of f at zero, all right? So why don't you guys go ahead and do that, all right? You go ahead and try letter A. Say again, sorry? I see what you're saying. So, hmm, let me take a look here real quick.
Hmm. All right, sorry. Repeat your question. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, um, what I would so what you can do here as an example is to write out the first few terms, you know, and then you get an idea about what the what it'll be from there. I think. Okay. Or actually, really, just after the first term, I think you get an idea about what the what the what it'll you know be. <coughs> what the derivative of zero will be. So is there a way to like place that center? So that is the derivative of the series. Yes. Okay. But um, now when you go to plug in zero for x, right? You so what I suggest you do is write out the first few terms, like expand this out, you know what I mean? Expand out the first few terms, and then you can get an idea of what the first derivative will be. Is there a way to like bypass like all the other terms that have to find, like take it to the fourth derivative? Fourth derivative, yes, so, so yes there is. Keep in mind that for a, um, a you know, general Maclaurin polynomial, it's f prime, sorry. Um, the nth derivative of f at zero. So any and like a generic term, you know, the nth term of a Maclaurin polynomial will be in this format. Um, okay. So then the um, the um, fourth derivative, right, is what you would want. So that would be then you want to find. So that's like n equals 4 here for fourth derivative. So you can just plug 4 and for all those pieces, okay? And then, you know, so in this case it would be, well, uh, x. Oops, sorry. Back. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And so then. Right, we can kind of like, those pieces are kind of like canceled out, right? Yeah. And then so we want to get just the fourth derivative. So it'll be just multiply the four factorial over. There's what the derivative, the fourth derivative is going to have. So since we found the fourth term, you did? Find the fourth term. You know, the general generic fourth term there, set it equal to then what this thing says the fourth term is, and then solve for the fourth term of the zero piece. That's all you gotta do. So, which isn't so bad here, like you could do kind of like brute force it, like you were saying, write out the terms, take the fourth derivative, and just come up with it. Um, but if I was asking to do like the 15th derivative, the 20th derivative, you know, so on and so forth, yeah. it must be to do it this way, kind of thing. So, because there's no x in, uh, in like the new equation, like what do you call the new equation? Which new equation right here you're saying? No, so the one is this f to the this one here? F to the four to the zero, another one down. To here. Yeah. Okay, so what I did here, sorry. Whoops. Like where would you How put pick up zero? green? All right, sorry. Um so um what I did was because these both had an x to the fourth, you can imagine just like dividing yeah, yeah, yeah. x to the fourth. Sorry. So well, like what do you do with the zero now? That so this is this. Oh, uh, that's just what the The fourth derivative of f at zero is this, right? And that's what this is saying. Right? If, if these two things are going to be true, right, both a McLaurin polynomial generically have to have this format, and in this specific case, our specific McLaurin polynomial has to be in this format, then the only way to get this piece is to have this be equal to that, right? Because they both have an x to the fourth. So it means this coefficient has to be equal to this coefficient, and so you just solve it. No, I, I agree. It throws me off a little bit too, especially because we're trying to find the first derivative here. Then it kind of like messes. So I want to write out my that. terms first to mm -hmm. make it easier. But where, like, how do I start with this one? So we'll just start with n equals two. So that means any any time the first term is going to really have all your n's be two. Over three. Mm -hmm. Over three to the two. And then times, and I would maybe leave it as 3 to the 2 there just because okay. it might be Can't helpful. Yeah, exactly. You just be able to see the patterns and stuff like that. And then times x to the second, right? And then you do the next term, which would be n equals 3 and 4 and 5 from there. <coughs> yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
you're feeling good, feel free to move on to letter uh, B and C, of course, if you feel like you can do this. I feel like I think it's you know pretty pretty doable. I don't think there's any real surprises there, except uh, letter C. It might get a little bit tricky when you have the natural logs in there. We haven't talked about that a whole lot. Um, we talked about it briefly in the previous problems about what you can relate that natural log to. But yes. So we're talking about Maclaurin series, right? So a generic term in a Maclaurin series is, is this format, right? If you're talking Taylor, it would be F to the nth root of F at C, X minus C to the n over n factorial. But since it's Maclaurin, the Cs are zero, so it's F to the n of zero, X minus zero, so it's X to the n over n factorial, right? So you recognize this from before when you're doing Maclaurin series. But then for this particular <coughs> Maclaurin series, this is our pattern. So the fourth fourth term in this, right, we just plug in n equals 4 for the fourth term, and so it would be ln, um, ln 4 over 3 to the fourth, 4 to the third, x to the fourth, right, and so which is all this right here. And so then, well, if, if this is the fourth term generically, and this is the fourth term specifically, then these two things have to kind of match up, right? Well, the x to the fourth, so right, we don't worry about those, we just want to match the coefficient to the coefficient here. How do we do that? Well, if we're trying to get, we can just multiply the fourth factorial over right now and see, aha, the fourth root of the zero must be that. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry, hold on. Sorry. I have to pull the rest of the words here. Okay, so I'm going to at least get through here letter A. So f prime of 0, okay, f prime of 0 is 0, okay? And again, you can see that <coughs> if you like, if we expand out this um, series here, or maybe I can, I can say I put an equals there, um, you know, the, the, so the first term is really at n equals 2, so it'll be natural log 2 over 3 to the 2, 2 to the third, x to the 2. Right? And then plus, and then third, the next term, which is really n equals 3, will then be ln 3 over 3 to the third, 3 to the third, x to the third. And I'll do one more here. ln 4 over 3 to the fourth, 4 to the third, x to the fourth, plus dot, dot, dot. You get the idea there. Okay? So, imagine taking the derivative of this, the first derivative of this, right? All the terms will still have an x in them, right? This 2 will go out front. It'll be, you know, x. This will be x squared. This will be x to the third, so on and so forth. When you plug in 0 then, since all these terms have x's, plugging in 0, this whole thing will be 0. And so f prime of 0 certainly is 0, okay? But then we get to the fourth derivative, and it's like, man, do we really want to take four derivatives of this thing, right? Do we really want to take four derivatives? Probably not. It's not so bad, right? We could brute force this, but let me show you an alternative here. And again, it has to do with using what we already know about Maclaurin and Taylor series, right? We know that the Maclaurin series follows this kind of generic format, right? Oh, let me go up here and do this. So Maclaurin series follows these generic formats of each term is the nth derivative of f at 0 times x to the n over n factorial, right? Isn't that what, how we get a Maclaurin series? The nth derivative of f at 0 
times x to the n over n factorial, right? If it was a Taylor, it would be the nth derivative of f at c times x minus c to the n all over n factorial. But since it's Maclaurin, all the c's are zero, so we just you know, replace that there, right? So we know this to be true for any Maclaurin series. So if we want to find the fourth term, which is the fourth, if we want to find the fourth derivative, we want to find the fourth term, right? So we could say, okay, f, the fourth derivative of f at zero times x to the four over four factorial, right? This term will give us that value of the fourth derivative at zero. Right? That's the fourth term of our Maclaurin series. But then we also can use this series here to get the term at n equals 4, right? So what does this series say the term is at n equals 4? Well, it's natural log of 4 over 3 to the 4, 4 to the 3rd, x to the 4, okay? So the n equals 4 term for this series and the n equals 4 term for the Maclaurin series, right? This is the, the n equals 4 term from the Maclaurin series, but it also needs to match this format as well. And so you can see that then this piece right here, this is the coefficient for x to the 4th, and this is the coefficient for x to the 4th. So just set them equal to each other. Okay. Just set them equal, right? They will just set, they have to be equal because they're both representing the same thing. One is kind of the generic representation of the Maclaurin series. One is the specific one here to our problem, but we, these still both hold true simultaneously. Okay, they're both describing the same thing, the fourth term of the Maclaurin series, or n equals four term of the Maclaurin series. And so what's left for us to do here to get to solve for the fourth derivative at zero? Well, there's the fourth derivative at zero. What's with it that we need to get rid of? Yeah, multiplies both sides by four factorial. So the fourth derivative at zero is equal to the four factorial natural log of four over three to the fourth, four to the third. And you can stop right there. <coughs> okay, so there are your two answers. Now, you might think to yourself, because I've been in your shoes before, and this is how I would think sometimes, I'd be like, that is weird and confusing to me, and I reject it. I will just write out the terms and take four derivatives of that. And you can choose to do that, and that might work for you most of the time, some of the time at least, right? But I would really recommend that you, you do get a handle on this, because if I ask to do the 20th derivative at zero, you're not going to want to take the derivative of this thing 20 <coughs> times, okay? So um, I would really recommend that you try and get a handle on this thing here. I'll be happy to try and explain some more for you too later, you know, kind of thing. But, <coughs> or now if you really want, but <coughs> anyway, really try and, you know, get this worked out in your head, because it will be helpful to understand and, and use. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So letter B, did anyone get to this point? Do we identify whether F has a relative minimum, relative maximum, or neither? Relative minimum, yes. So F has a relative minimum in this case um, because f prime of 0 equals 0, right, indicating we have a critical point. So it is important to establish you have a critical point, right? You just don't go to the second derivative and check the concavity. You have to first check that you have a critical point at that value, 0 here in this case. And then also we check, check the second derivative, and that is greater than 0 in this case. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So the second derivative here is going to be this coefficient. Well, well, two times that coefficient, I should say there. So f prime prime of 0 is equal to what? 2 ln 2 over 3 squared times 2 to the third. <coughs> OK. All right. Letter C. Using the ratio test, determine, well, actually, sorry, any questions on letter B before I move on? Go there. Okay. Let us see. Last one here. Um, F using the ratio test determine the interval of convergence of the Maclaurin series for F. So that, well, that's nice. They tell us what test to use here. So we know how to set that up, right? It's the limit as n approaches infinity, and then we'll do the. Um, what's that? No, it's always been as n approaches infinity. 
So no, but that, you're not the only person there that's thought that. So you know, will um, yeah, Sean, Sean is admitting to it, but I don't. Want to, I was going to call him that, but he also thought that too. So yes, it's not as n approaches zero. It's as n approaches infinity, which is why we use like L'Hopital's rule and use the degree of the top and the degree of the bottom when we're taking you know and to evaluate the limits and yeah. All right, good. So moving on. So the next term here, what will that look like? It'll be natural log of n plus one. Um, times x to the n plus 1. I'm going to go ahead and move the x to the n in the numerator there. Over, and then 3 to the n plus 1, n plus 1 to the third times, and then I'll multiply by the reciprocal of the previous one. So we'll have 3 to the n times n to the third over natural log n, x to the n. <clears throat> okay, so this simplifies some, thankfully, because that's pretty messy otherwise, so... Um, let's see here. The 3 to the n and the 3 to the n plus 1 will leave us with just a 3 in the denominator here. The x to the n plus 1 and the x to the n leaves you with an x in the numerator. And I'm going to collect all my remaining terms that have n's as another separate product over here, which just for neatness sake, I guess. So we'll have natural log n plus 1 times n to the third over n plus 1 to the third times the natural log of n. <coughs> OK. And now it gets a little bit funky. Because we want to say that this goes to what? Infinity. All right, well, we want to take the limit as n approaches infinity. OK, so what do we want to say? What do you guys, anyone, I mean, what, what do we want to say this is going to be? Just what? What is this going to go to? Well, let's just say, what is this going to go to right here? I want to say it goes to 1. I mean, 0 would make it easy, but actually I think 1, right? Because then we're just going to end with that x over 3. And in fact, it does. This does go to 1. But how can we kind of convince ourselves that that is so, given that we have these natural logs in here? So, right, we could take the derivative, but if you remember for the natural log, those derivatives are going to go on infinitely, right? That's why L'Hopital's wouldn't work here. Nick, you have a... Can you break up the natural log in the numerator? So, um, because of the n plus 1, you mean? So unfortunately, no. Addition inside the natural log, can't, if it was multiplication inside, then we could break it up. But if it's addition inside, that doesn't break up. No properties there. We've dealt with this before in the last unit. I don't know if Matt, you remember. Uh, could you say that then n to the third is not the limit of n plus 1 to the third, but the n would become n to the third on the bottom as well? So in, in, in a sense, yes. So right, exactly. This is, so the degree, so certainly if we had no natural logarithms here, you, you'd be, you're exactly right. We have the n cube, we have the n plus 1 cube, so the degree of the top and the bottom are the same. Ratio of the coefficients, so it would be 1. But with these natural logs, what can we do? Yeah, Matthias? Don't you combine them by like, subtracting So, well, that's true. But then we would get, if we did that, then we would get 0, right? Oh, wait, no. Sorry, we can't do that because division... Division outside does not become subtraction inside. It's only division inside between the inside logarithm becomes division outside. So yeah, no, we can't do that either. All right, but here, so if, and this is something we talked about, but I know it's been a while since so we talked about this. We said in the past that the natural log of n is always going to be less than actual n itself. The natural log of n will always be less than n itself. Okay, and then likewise, we can say here then the natural log of n plus 1 will always be less than, let's just say, n plus 1. Okay, and we're going to kind of use the idea then, since the natural log of n plus 1 is always less than n plus 1, since the natural log of n is always less than n, if we treat these things as just n plus 1 and n, right, and if that thing converges, then certainly the thing smaller than it will also converge here, right? That's kind of the idea. And so will this then converge to something? It's going to converge to 1. It goes to 1 now, OK? So we're just going to say it goes to 1. OK, so we're treating this natural log of n plus 1 like it's n plus 1. It's a little bit smaller than that, but that's OK. Same thing here. We're treating this natural log of n as just another n. So we get a fourth degree over a fourth degree. Same ratio of the coefficients, that goes to 1. And again, we want it to be less than 1. So we end up then with x over 3. Absolute value is less than 1. And so we get negative 3 less than x less than 3 if I skip a couple steps there, right, and get to that. <clears throat> right. But of course, we're not done yet, right? Because what do we still have to do? 
Check the endpoints. That's right, because we use the ratio test. We gotta make sure we check what happens when x is when we get exactly one for our ratio. So we're gonna check the endpoints. So plugging in the negative three, we get the natural log of n over three to the n times n to the third times negative three to the n. Okay, and that negative three to the n almost completely cancels with that three to the n in the denominator, doesn't it? But it's not quite right. Remember though, negative three to the n is the same thing as negative one to the n times three to the n. Right, we can pull apart the negative three to the n, make it negative one to the n, three to the n. And so then the three to the n's can cancel. And so then this just becomes natural log n over n cubed times negative one to the end like that. <clears throat> okay. So what test can we use here to determine the convergence or divergence? Alternating. Alternating series, does it converge or diverge? Yeah, so it's going to converge here. You can you can you know run it through if you like to there, but it does converge. Okay. All right, alternating series says yes, yes, exactly. It is 50-50. You chose wisely. <clears throat> okay. But it does work if you, you know, take the limit as n approaches infinity of um, of this piece, right? It's going to go to zero. If you take the next term, you'll see that it'll be less than the previous term. So it does, you know, work. All right. And then x equals three. That's natural log of n over three to the n, n cubed times three to the n there which that does nicely cancel out. We don't have to worry about that. We don't have to like break anything up there. It's just n to the third. <clears throat> okay. So what should we do here for this one? It doesn't alternate. So Sean? Can we use the same like principle where ln of n is less than n? So you're going to get, no matter what, you're going to get a convergent it will be convergent. We're going to compare it to, yeah, what? What are we going to compare it to? 1 over n squared, right? Since we're, con we're considering ln n to be like n, but just a little bit less than it, right? So that's n over n cubed, which is like 1 over n squared. So like versus, you know, 1 over n squared there. We know this converges by p series, so therefore by limit comparison, this will also converge as well. So... And that'll do it. Limit comparison convergence. Okay, so interval convergence is negative 3 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 3. Final answer. Question? Yes, the limit comparison for this you're saying? Okay, yeah. So any other questions? All right, so Sarah wants me to show the limit comparison. I'm going to do that up here on the board, but in the meantime, if, if you're interested, please follow along. If not, I'm going to give you your homework and you can start on that, okay? So <clears throat> let me do that first, Sarah. What is it? What are you show her the, just re refreshing her memory about the limit yeah. comparison, yeah. how we know that this versus this will actually oh, yeah, result yeah. in a convergent okay. series and stuff like that. So I'm going to show that here. Yeah, I'm going to share it with you. Yeah, please. Video then, and then we can. <coughs> We're still videoing. Oh, I'll, I'll just edit that part out.
Where did that come from? 